Okay, I've been thinking more on this on how to tackle the logistics aspect of guerrilla warfare. I did a video on uh, edible vegetation and I always push learning the edible plants and that stuff in your area, learn how to make snares, learn how to set out a trot line for catching fish, maybe using nets to catch fish, you know, whatever, whatever ways you can to get a hold of edibles so that you're not having to rely only off what you take off your enemy. Well, the next area that needs to be covered is ammunition. So, resupplying ammunition during the conflict. And really, there's five ways this is going to be done. Now, right in the beginning of the war, the primary way you're going to replace your ammunition is from established caches and stockpiles. This is stuff you got a hold of before the war. You got in a place across your area of operations that you can access it. The next way, and this is the way every gorilla needs to resupply ammunition, never forget this, is what you take off the enemy, what you capture. Now with that you could also put in there what you steal from their bases. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong used to sneak onto U.S. bases. They had tunnels coming right into the bases, typically up near the uh, supply dumps, especially ammunition dumps. They would come in at night, they would take some crates, maybe make one stack of ammunition disappear or a few more cases off of a particular stack that's already been uh, taken down some take that down in a tunnel and it would disappear and hopefully the uh, stupid GI wouldn't notice it. Maybe figured someone screwed up on the paperwork. Obviously you take ammunition off the enemy, you take those bandoliers, you take those magazines, you take those belts of ammo. You attack a supply convoy, you uh, knock out a truck that's got ammunition in back, you start pulling out as many of those crates, as many of those cans, as many of those uh, tubes if you see artillery ammunition, it typically comes in this giant canister or tube thing. You grab as much of that and you get it taken out and you stockpile, you cache what you cannot use at the time. Next way is black market. There is always a black market during warfare. Always. The enemy does exploit it. So I will give you a warning on this. Now, with the black market, you're always going to have troops from the conventional military that will sell stuff on the black market, and they will write it off as a loss, or, you know, the wrong number was sent, or they issued it out, whatever. That stuff ends up on the black market. During Vietnam, it was... It did happen, it didn't happen a lot, but you did have some people in the Quartermaster Corps, they would even sell ammunition and weapons. Now, they may have justified it in their own mind that they were selling it to such and such criminal organization that they owed money to for gambling, hookers, or whatever, or drugs. But a lot of that stuff ended up in the hands of the Viet Cong. Now, Here's a warning on this. I know this was done in Vietnam, and I've heard rumors this was done during the Soviet-Afghan War. Some of that ammunition and those weapons that were sold on the black market was deliberately tampered with so that it would explode in the hands of the guerrilla. The Soviets would send out, and I've seen this in a couple movies and that stuff, and I've come across references on this. The movies kind of gave me a bit of an idea how they might have done this. You had the Soviet soldier who's out looking for a drink. He's looking for alcohol. Well, the Afghan, who's really working for the Mujahideen, he has alcohol that he brought in from, you know, Pakistan, from, where, from wherever else, probably brought in from India. That Soviet soldier trades ammunition to get the alcohol. Now, 
is that Soviet soldier actually a drunk or is he actually sending out bad ammunition? If it's deliberately sending out bad ammunition, well that alcohol would get dumped and that stuff. They wouldn't drink it or maybe they would give it a try. Who knows? But uh, with that ammunition, they would not tamper with every round. If you do that, it's self-defeating. You only tamper with, say, one out of every 25, or one out of every 10, or one out of every five rounds. So when one of those uh, hot load rounds would get chambered inside the rifle, it gets fired. The firing pin goes forward, it hits the primer. Instead of the bullet going down range, you have a massive explosion that rips the rifle apart. So maybe instead of there being gunpowder inside there, there was a pressure sensitive type explosive along the lines of your RDX. The primer goes off, sets it off, the rifle explodes in the face of the guerrilla soldier, injuring or killing them. It also makes them not trust their weapons, trust their ammunition. Now another source is foreign or outside aid. This could be from a foreign government that is supportive of the guerrilla. It could be a foreign organization that is supportive of the guerrilla. Or typically it's going to be from your dysphoria. Your citizens who left the country because of the war, they fled with their families to protect their families. They want to take a part in the conflict they want to be part of the fight but they don't want to be on the battlefield so they'll support it in some other way maybe by sending cash or supplies so you'll see ammunition you'll see weapons coming in from that source now the main focus of this video is going to be on reloading now i am not a reloader i do not know a ton of information on it don't ask me any specifics i'm not going to be able to help you okay I don't know the technical information off the top of my head for rattling off for what you need to get to reload ammunition to an M193 standard for 5.56. I don't know. I know bits and pieces on it. It is one of those skills I want to learn. It is one of those skills that I believe the best way to learn it is hands-on. So find a person that knows how to reload. Learn how to do it with them. And then once you get a good handle on it, then get some of your own equipment, get the supplies. Reload on your own for yourself. Now, to go along with this, on the battlefield, you're done with the ambush, you're done with the operation, you're collecting up the supplies off the enemy, you're stripping their, uh, their corpses and stuff. Have a few people that are designated to collect up the brass, collect up the empty magazines, clips, links, grenade pins, safety spoons from grenades, all that stuff. Things that can be repurposed, reused. So, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to take this, and we want to make it into this. And yes, I highly recommend get a whole bunch of these stripper clips in large quantities for when you pump out ammunition for resupply, you get the clips reloaded and that's what gets sent out to the troops. It'll make reloading that much easier. So we're going to go down here. Try closing in. Now we have ourselves our little Gorilla Ammunition Factory. I did kind of base this off of the dugouts used by the uh, British Auxiliary Forces in World War II. For those of you that remember, the British Auxiliaries were the guerrillas set up by the British government for if the Nazis invaded. So we have our little underground bunker here. 
This was uh, prepared before the war by the militia auxiliary. Maybe a couple of uh, militia members helped out in digging it and building it. We have our entrance, which is off this way, which is hidden underneath maybe a uh, machine shed. Maybe it's hidden underneath a garden shed. You know, just your little tool shed out back. And then we have our exit over here, which will lead off somewhere off property, a location where the uh, gorillas could come to to pick up the ammunition for resupplying themselves and potentially dropping off those sandbags filled with brass and stuff from the battlefield. Now, we have our front of the operation starts here. We have our big uh, barrels or something sitting here where those sandbags get dumped into when they show up. And then those sandbags get set off on the side for giving back to the uh, gorillas when they come back with the next loaded bags. We have our front room up here. That is our sorting, inspecting, and cleaning area. So we have a big table set up here. Next to it, we have uh, bins for putting in our sorted and cleaned brass. So we have a couple people working on the sorting. They reach back, they get a few big scoops of brass and stuff from the barrel, get it on the table, and they start sorting it. They sort out the links, put them inside one uh, particular container, maybe underneath the table, and you uh, sort those links also. You'll sort out the links for the M249 from the links for 50 calibers, from the links from 7.62 millimeter for your M240s. You have that stuff sorted out. That's all part of the sorting process. The brass gets sorted. The 9 millimeter goes inside one bucket. The 45 goes inside another. The 556 and 223 goes inside another. Your 762, your 308s go inside another. Your 50 caliber goes inside another. Your shotgun shells go inside another. You sort all the stuff out. And then you'll have someone here who's in, who's going to be in charge of cleaning. He he then takes those uh, buckets as they get full or containers, and he inspects it. He pulls out each individual uh, casing and he checks it out. He makes sure it's not ruptured. He makes sure that there isn't garbage inside it because there could be stones that are lodged up in there. It could be full of mud. You know, whatever. And then he sorts accordingly. If the brass is bad, have a little can underneath for tossing it in. You know, if there's no way to get that uh, debris out of the casing, toss it in there. And then that brass will probably ultimately go somewhere else and get melted down and reforged into something else that's useful for the militia. Then he goes through and he starts cleaning the brass. And he cleans it according to what it is. So all the 5.56 to 223s inside one type of cleaning station, in one uh, cleaning station, all the 7.62s inside another. And you just, you don't mix the stuff inside the cleaner, you keep it separate. Once the stuff is done, it's cleaned, it gets put in the appropriate bin on the end. You have the reloading station in here. When they need another bin, they got an opening, they come over, they pick up that full bin, they bring it here, they put it up along the wall. You have a couple people working reloading machines up in here. They're resizing whatever needs to be done. They're going through and reloading the ammunition, putting in the powder, putting in the primers, putting in in the slugs. And then that'll get put inside probably some type of bucket or bin, which will then get taken over to the corner here to the packing station. At the packing station, you'll have one or two people that'll be loading them on stripper clips or reloading belts. That stuff then gets put inside cans, which gets set yeah, empty cans under the table, full cans go over here once they're full. Once you get a big stack here, you'll have a person who's running your quality control. This person's also the one that will take the full cans from here, put them over here. This quality check, quality control person, they'll pull the occasional uh, filled rounds from over here and check them out. 
they may also pull some brass from over here once in a while and check it out to make sure that it is up to standard. They'll also check the cans and belts and all that stuff make sure that the correct number of rounds are in there especially on the belts and that the cans are loaded correctly and then all the stuff when it's completed it gets put over here and then when it's ready to go out to either get sent into a cache get picked up by a militia unit that's traveling through the area whatever those cans those crates whatever get picked up from here and go out the tunnel out the back door. Now you probably should have other uh, stations that are set up to support this. Maybe there's a way we can uh, cast our own copper jacketed slugs instead of just relying off of what we purchased at the before the conflict manufacturing our own I know there's people out there that have posted videos on it and you know people are trying to come up with efficient cost-effective ways for casting copper jacketed slugs because most modern weaponry the ammunition needs to be copper jacketed it can't just be straight lead rounds you could also have a uh, area that's set up a building somewhere that creates smokeless powder it's not beyond the realm of possibilities maybe you have a uh, high school chemistry teacher who supports the cause he's out there and he's cranking out homemade smokeless powder it gets tested and all that stuff we know the correct uh, amounts that needs to be put in the rounds and all that and that comes in to get uh, used in the process also. The uh, spent primers that get uh, taken out with the uh, cleaning process and stuff, there's supposed to be ways that you can uh, flatten them back out and reload them. So maybe you got a station somewhere else that's you know manufacturing primers and they come in also you have your little spread out ammunition facility maybe you have like two or three places like this set up and then you got a station or in a, a bunker somewhere set up that's manufacturing powder maybe another uh, little workshop somewhere that's next to a uh, homemade blacksmith shop that's cranking out the uh, copper jacketed uh, slugs maybe you got the uh, high school chemistry teacher he's got a little uh, closet hidden inside his house and he's uh, cranking out uh, primers and remember all the stuff that gets homemade needs to get tested even some of this ammunition before it gets approved and gets sent out you're gonna have to test it somehow so maybe have some type of station somewhere that this quality control person can test those rounds Maybe they'll go out to a, uh, another bunker somewhere or maybe back in the woods and they'll fire off you know, a couple rounds from each set to make sure the rounds are good. And then they come back with the results and they uh, tag that uh, batch that, okay, good to go. If that batch is bad, it goes back into the process to get uh, redone and fix or correct whatever deficiency there was inside that round whether it's bad powder, bad primer, or who knows. Just something for you to think about on the logistics side. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, that I do know, because there's documentaries on this, that in Israel, before it became Israel, at the end of World War II, they were manufacturing their own ammo in underground shelters. They actually had purchased the equipment from Europe. The factory equipment from ammunition factories brought it in secretly, located it underneath 
uh, things like laundromats and other types of uh, metalworking shops where they had, uh, you know, your drill presses and, and stuff like that. So the uh, power usage wouldn't be noticed and the noise wouldn't be noticed as much. They were cranking out their own ammo. They were bringing in brass, melting it down, casting it, flattening it out in sheets. They got brought into the uh, little factory that got pressed out into little cups, which got formed into cartridge casings. And then they put in the primers, put in the powder that they created somewhere else, put in the slugs they created somewhere else. They tested it and it went out to the different guerrilla organizations. So this type of thing has been done before and people have even gone more hardcore into it. This is really a uh, dumbed down version of it with what we have available to us right now. Something for you to think about. Something for you to plan for. Now for all my engineer brothers in the Patriot and Militia movements, always remember, essay